So one minute past nine. Um, if we can all, that's it, record. There are still more people coming into the room. Uh, welcome very much. Uh, well, welcome everyone to this beginning of the of a three day seminar. And it is my pleasure really to, to welcome you. I am a principal investigator of the research project that this seminar is a part of. It's uh, <laughs> called uh, a post qualitative uh, research collective. And we thought it might be nice just to say a little bit before we the official opening. And one of the things that in post qualitative research were very much sort of trouble, uh, linear temporalities. And you might, when you looked at the program, thought, hey, how can we start with something before the official opening? And so maybe we always. <laughs> Uh, at the beginning of something, definitely in, in learning too. And so this research project is really about a meeting, meetings of people interested in post-qualitative research. And some people might be just starting off, some people might have already been busy with it for years. And the whole idea of the seminar is that it's, we are in conversation with one another, that we get to know each other better, um, that it is, as it says, it's building a collective, building increase, well, we already are a collective, but uh, that we are, get to know each other better in that way. So one of the things that we thought, and uh, Roseanne is going to tell you more about that in a minute, and um, I think I'm introducing you as well, aren't I, Roseanne? Roseanne is a lecturer in early childhood at the University of Cape Town, and she is a, a co-principal investigator of this research project. And one of the things that is really one of the aims, and I'll talk more about it after this um, returning webinar, is to, um, to think about how uh, research at all levels, post qualitative uh, research, how we can support each other in, in doing it. And so Roseanne will say a little bit more about that. Um, but just to say that we would love you to open your, uh, your cameras all the way through. Uh, we, what we're trying to do is as much as possible is try to meet as if we were physically as fleshy beings uh, together. So throughout the three days, of course, there are moments you say, I prefer not to, but there are, um, if we were in the same space, then that would happen as well. And I don't know about you, but um, always, you know, certain kind of Zoom meetings that I find are quite hard to engage with. And so we would, we would try to do is something different. You can see I've just come out of the sea, you know, I haven't dried my hair properly. Please feel free just to be as um, informal and um, that you don't have to talk from a position of knowing or being certain about, but that we are here just to think together and experiment together. So welcome. I'm going to hand over to Roseanne. Thank you, Karen. Thank you so much. You've just moved in the room. Um, <laughs> I am delighted today to be in conversation with um, Dr. Judy Grabe and Dr. Veronica Mitchell. And I'm very excited to be part of this post-qualitative um, research collective as Karen has just explained. And what we're doing this morning in this seminar is this is actually part of a series that has started already happening. When do things start? When do things finish? And particularly we're looking at PhD graduates, people who have completed or submitted and are waiting, awaiting examination to learn about their PhD process. So this is particularly for students and for supervisors or for potential students. How do we engage in post qualitative research? And then just to reinforce what Karen said, it's very difficult to do this. We, we part, you know, in a way we're used to being in a Zoom, but maybe not either. Each time it's a different experience. So as Karen says, we really do encourage you to put your videos on. I'll share a short anecdote. Um, I'm a lecturer at UCT and in the first year of the pandemic in 2020, as you know, it was very difficult um, moving from being in person to being in a Zoom room. 
And when it was safe to do so, my students, we met for a reunion and they said to me, Rosen, we liked when you told us to unmute our mics to laugh when you made a joke. So I encourage <laughs> you <laughs> to unmute your mic at least to laugh with somebody. Because you know, when, when you're talking, you sort of are hoping you can somebody hear me all day there. <laughs> and so thank you, Karen. <laughs> so I, I encourage you to, to unmute and go, mm-hmm, when you agree, or mm-mm, when you disagree with, with one of our presenters. So we we in this, we really are not all in this together in the same way, but we are in this together today. Um so just to explain a little bit about the way we're going to be doing things, I am passionate and very interested and in my research interest is in philosophy with children. And the pedagogy of philosophy with children is the community of philosophical inquiry. And that's the way we're going to, and I've learned all that from Karen, who was my supervisor. Um, and there are lots of people in the room, Judy too, that uses um, the community of philosophical inquiry. So it's more about asking questions. It's about normalizing disagreement. It's about not looking for answers, but going, how else can we move these questions around to help us disrupt our relationships with knowledge, with who knows, who is the teacher, who is the student. So um, our, our format today, for example, is we're going to have a couple of questions. So it is a conversation and I'm going to be asking Judy and Veronica particular questions and we invite you to make some notes and hopefully near the end we'll have some engagement with the rest of you around things that they brought up that are particularly interesting to you, provoking you, maybe it's something you hadn't thought about or maybe it's something you spend your life thinking about and you'd like to share it with the rest of us. So um, we haven't, um, we've got till quarter past 10. I do apologize, I do tend to speak quite fast, so I'm going to try and slow down and if you want to just um, put something in the chat. Annika Slubbert is also with us. Maybe you could just wave, Annika, they can see you. Annika's um, our research assistant and she'll be monitoring the chat and just checking that we are all as well as we could be. So again, welcome everyone. And I'm going to give you 30 seconds just to orientate yourself and then we will start. And it might be worth repeating uh, for people who came in later that we really would love you to put on your uh, camera so that we as much as possible are in the same room together. I know that that's not always possible, but we would really uh, appreciate it. <laughs> Good. A pajamas is fine. More Catherine, than fine. We didn't know, Catherine. Well, <laughs> <laughs> um, I wrote for shame. <laughs> okay, so, okay, let's start. Um, we're going to begin. So good morning again to everyone. Um, Veronica has prepared a little, I've, I've just asked, this is the first question that I'm asking Veronica and Judy. And um, Veronica has prepared her introduction in the form of a video, which Annika will show in a minute. So let me just, just tell you what the first question is. Um, I'm asking Veronica and Judy to introduce themselves briefly by sharing one example from their PhD process which expresses what worked in terms of supervision um, or your research or what you as a, use, as a PhD student, um, what has worked for you. And then at the end of the introduction, they are going to share a question they have formulated and we'll use those questions to move the discussion forward. So over to you, Veronica. Thanks, Annika, for sharing Veronica's. Veronica has chosen to do an introduction as a little video. Thanks so much. A few snippets from my PhD. Coffee mattered. Cafe lattes, cappuccinos, Americanas. In fact, I met one of my supervisors, Viv Bozilek, in a coffee shop, where she encouraged me to join her Shut Up and Write group. And perhaps that's how this process got started in academia. My PhD journey related to my work with students in their fourth year in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at the University of Cape Town, where for 12 years I've been listening to student stories related to their time in obstetric units, birthing units, where they witness 
an incredible amount of mistreatment of women in labor, abuse, and neglect. So I titled my PhD, Medical Students' Responsibility to Unjust Practices in Obstetrics, a Relational Perspective. And my main question was what renders students incapable in their responses to injustice that they may witness in obstetrics. I was asked to look back at my proposal, which was very different to what my thesis ended up as being. At the start of the proposal, I looked at, I was going to do, I was going to write, follow design-based research, very structured, pre-planned. I would engage in the problem, find a solution, look at mechanisms to enable the in, an intervention, and then develop principles from the product and the outcome. But that wasn't going to happen. As I explored what is now called obstetric violence, I realized it was far bigger. That there's no ways I could find a solution. It was a, it's a global problem. And there's an increasing amount of activism happening now, but five years ago, there was very little happening, still silenced. What was really helpful to me in this shift were reading groups. Many of you on this, um, on this course, on this conference, were, attend were in the Neville Alexander Building in the School of Education at UCT, where we started with Halevi Lenz Taguchi's book, Going Beyond the Theory Practice Divide. I loved that book, and it opened up new ways of thinking for me. And I was also introduced to Karen Barad in that book, Karen Barad's work in that book. Then Alicia Jackson and Lisa Mazai's book, Thinking with Theory, alerted me to the many perspectives of handling data and what is data and how do we work with it? Karen Barad's book, Meeting the Universe, has been very much part of my journey with Vivian Bozilek and others. Here's her book showing how much she has read it, how much she has shared the reading with others and even the dogs. And part of this journey has included collaborative publications along the way, which have really helped me engage with theory, think with theory and learn from others as role models and their expertise. Art making was part of my methodology and pedagogical device. Here, yeah, the, uh, the, the drawing on the left shows how some of my, my data, my, my engagement with students actually resonated with the readings. For instance, here a student was showing himself on a pedestal with a white coat. But without that white coat, he would have just been anyone with his colleagues in Langa. And that reminded me of the student Sarah in Alicia Jackson and Lisa Mazai's book, who found that wearing a suit gave her confidence status and made her feel very different, that material agency and force. So looking back, it's been an iterative relationship building process, very different to what I expected. I thought I'd just be reflecting, representing, but it was much, much more. I found diffractive practice very much more effective, powerful, and it's enabled me to look through different windows at an urgent topic of need. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> um, when Roseanne and Karen asked me to um, talk about my PhD, I realized that I'd be much more comfortable with um, visuals as well, um, because much of my work, as you saw, much of my thinking is around um, images and the visual, which is quite ironical, as I also have an eyesight impairment. 
um, but that's the way it has been. And um, I mentioned one of my supervisors, Viv Boslik. I did have another supervisor who engaged in a very different way where text was everything. And the text was going to be the product. And um, he, he worked hard and well with me with the text. So my question that I would like to present to the group is what relationships matter to supervisors? Mm -hmm. And I'll pass the baton on to Judy. Thank you, Veronica. Thanks so much. Annika, I hope you got that one. What relationships develop, um, matter to supervisors? Thanks. Thanks. Judy, are you ready to? Yes. Okay. Good morning everyone again it's very early here in Britain <laughs> but well not too early but um but earlier than it is for you a couple of hours earlier so just to introduce myself I'm, I'm Judy and I I have been part of this amazing post-human reading group that Veronica uh, referred to so I know Roseanne very well who's my graduating colleague this December, <laughs> which was wonderful. Um, and obviously it's lovely to see, see Karen again. Not sure if Viv's in the room, but Viv was my other supervisor um, too, like, like Veronica. Yeah. Viv is in the room. Hello Viv, wherever you are. <laughs> um, Viv so. is in the room, Judy, but she's masked. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, okay, okay. Great. Well, I just wanted to acknowledge <laughs> acknowledge you both, really, at the start, and seeing as this is about the question sort of referred to supervision, obviously I've, I've thought about you a lot, just preparing for it. Um, so probably just by way of introduction, the most important thing, I think, to say about my research um, is that it was uh, integral within my work as a teacher. I really saw research and teaching as, as Tim Ingold says, as not separate practices. They, research is involved in, in teaching. So my problems in teaching that I was coming up with against or, or in, as I was teaching were, I've put the seedbed of the research. And my research was about enabling those problems to germinate into recognizable things. So, for example, what, what is an educated person even? <laughs> that's, how, that's how much I was grappling with the problems in, in teaching. So could, could an educated person be um, unable to read and write? Could you have someone educated? who's unable to read and write, but who can think and listen and, and build community. So what is an education? An educated person as an example. Overall, I think my thesis came to be about finding a way to teach that is open-ended rather than end-directed. So the whole uh, idea of reaching specific goals and targets um, at certain times, um, I really realized that that was not a way that I, I wanted to be educating. And that was the overall discovery, I think, for my, for my thesis, that education leads us out into, into open spaces. Wider and wider, dis displaces us all the time. So what worked for me in the PhD process was the question. And I, I've, I think I've, I've come up with two essential elements. It was a hard, it was a hard process. <laughs> and I, um, but it was essential for me to structure what I, what I needed to think about and to help me think. So firstly, uh, listening well to my supervisor's questions was, I'd say, the crucial element. Um, and that, that can be incredibly daunting. I don't know how, Roseanne and I worked in exactly the same way on Google Docs with, with um, Karen as our 
main supervisor and it <laughs> we used to just say oh, it's going to come back with comments you know you'd submit your 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 um work that you'd done that week and you'd be in fear and dread and sometimes Karen and Viv would be like on it immediately that you submitted and these questions would come back and you'd work for hours and hours and hours and hours on on thinking and then they'd be like why are you saying that? I mean, they were very good, <laughs> but but it, it was nevertheless daunting um, and often easy to take it as criticism when they were just genuine um, questions. And we worked that out. That they, oh, they're not cross with us. <laughs> they're just asking questions. So, but it's to really grapple with the comments and and be incredibly patient. So I put I, I, I mean being patient with your lack of understanding. And then, uh, as Veronica said, to reading a lot and reading closely and reading well to create understanding. So, so that was crucial for me. Um, so the questions my supervisors asked were hard to understand often um, because you go into your, your PhD with your own understanding and uh, of your problem and you have to find ways of articulating that um, in terms of your field, which for me was literacy research, and in terms of how you relate to your field. And for, for most of us here, obviously, if you've made that decision, it's, that's post qualitatively, uh, which is a field in itself. <laughs> um, so again, this is where the reading comes in. So that's the first element is listening carefully and, and to your, your, the questions being asked and being patient with your lack of understanding. The second element is then trusting in your own hesitation. <coughs> um, thinking for myself was important. It was crucial. If something didn't make sense to me, I had to stay honest about that. And I, and I to the point of like, thinking that you really are thick <laughs> and, and you just can't get stuff. But I, you, you just, I had to be honest with myself. Otherwise, um, I've written the ground. So that's your, your epistemology, your way of knowing and your ontology, your way of being in the world. So if you're not honest, then what you're building your thesis on can become very, very shaky. Uh, and I, I remember a girl that I met right at the beginning of the process saying, oh, if I'd just known how to do things post qualitatively or post humanly, I'd have never done my thesis this way. And she had just done a standard, I think, I don't know. I think it was a qualitative research or might've been a mixed qualitative quantitative. And I thought, I don't want to be that person ever. <laughs> I, it has to be honest to me. And um, it, it, that was an amazing process to, to stay honest with myself. Um, so Karen and Viv would suggest ways to approach my argument, but at the end of the day, I had to find the way that resonated most. Sometimes the hesitations and sense of total lack of capacity feel overwhelming. Um, I, I'm really grateful to Karen in that because I, I honestly thought I'd give up a few times and she'd go, don't be daft, of course you're going to, you know, <laughs> of course you're going to do it. I've got no doubt you'll do it. And, and it was, so it was almost her trust, her genuine, I felt she genuinely believed that I would when I genuinely thought that I couldn't. <laughs> so that, that is amazing. Um, sometimes you do have to compromise, I did learn, um, because you can't find a way that sits just right for you and for your supervisors. And especially when Karen and Viv both just persistently disagreed, I thought, okay. <laughs> I have to give in, <laughs> I have to compromise. Um, uh, and, and Sir Menning, for some of you might, might know him, helpfully said to me at one point, Judy, just 80%, 80%. If you're happy with 80% of what you put down, um, that's good. So I, I, I felt, and I think that probably is reflected in my, my thesis, that, I, that, that I'm happy with 80% of it. Or oh, I'll, I'll probably more. <laughs> so, in moving the discussion forward, the question um, I would ask, because I think our PhDs express what we care about, is, and I, I don't know really if I've got the best question at all, at all, <laughs> but it is, uh, what, do we, what do we care about? 
I know that's incredibly broad, but yeah. and I don't I don't know if it's very helpful. I think I'm, you know, things like obviously worlding is a big concept um, that that we that we used in our in our reading group, um, and we care about worlding. But yeah, I think there's a there's a fear somewhere in there for me of of the, the constantly becoming partisan and polarized and yeah yeah does that if that mm. doesn't help we are welcome to change the question <laughs> you great people who know about concepts which i still struggle with <laughs> the question is doing its 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 own work or play judy so thank you thank, thank you, you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Judy and Veronica. I also, I may have mentioned it, but in case people have come late, I have the privilege of actually knowing Judy and Veronica quite well. Um, and as Judy said, she's actually situated in the UK at the moment. So that's also really interesting for our discussion. Um, so it's quite a privilege to be hearing about the work um, differently, hearing about it, returning to the work that, that I was part of in, or not part of in so many ways. Uh, Judy and I certainly have worked much more closely, but again, um, so <coughs> ask everyone to think about, well, what we're gonna do now is we have the two questions. So I'm gonna pose them, the question that Veronica asked to Judy and Judy to Veronica, and we're gonna talk about those two questions. And if we just click on the chat, Annika, thank you for, for, post, for recording them. So um, Veronica's first question was, what relationships matter to supervisors? And then um, Judy asked, what do we care about? And so, Veronica, do you want to take us somewhere with that question? And then I'm going to ask Judy to respond to you and your question. And then Judy will talk, take us somewhere with her question. And then I'll ask Veronica to respond to that. So, Veronica, what relate? And, and can I ask, are you saying relation? OK, I won't, I won't ask yet what I wanted to ask. Um. I think when um, relationships is such a broad topic, particularly in terms of post-humanism and um, post-qualitative research, and um, the text in a PhD is hugely powerful because that's the product that people are working towards, and that's what's going to get marked and decide whether you get that PhD or not. So it's totally understandable that the text is so dominant um, with me, most PhD um, journeys. But in fact, one hears all the time how, how people struggle as individuals with their texts. So what I, um, what I experienced and what pulled me through were, was community, community in terms of more texts being shared with me by others, being in productive working spaces like coffee shops, which are unusual. Usually one would be meeting a supervisor in an office or where you work. My workplace at the time was quite disruptive and difficult. So the coffee shop and um, was firstly close to my home, I could walk there where transport is often difficult for me. And um, it was a productive space and a space where um, we met others, we worked on texts. So a little different to the usual, but it worked for me. And um, that was important. And people can, you know, looking at my video now with um, looking at it and thinking, well, are the coffees an indication of privilege? Because some people may not be able to be in that space. And perhaps it is. But then I don't have the privilege of a car or driving or easy public transport to get to other places. So one has to look at all perspectives. And um, that's what I also have really enjoyed seeing what what Every person's different. Every PhD is different. And even working with students in an obstetrics um, teaching unit where they play music, shout, scream, do role plays is different. So I guess 
my work, my work, my teaching and my research has been different in many ways, and in fact, quite radical and disruptive. Thank you. Um, Judy, would you like to just take Veronica's question further with you? I was going to, yeah. Um, and, and what is your response? I mean, Veronica, I was going to possibly say, do you say relationships or relations, but we won't change your question. I'm just asking, because I know, um, but yeah, that's just one mm -hmm. thing, because I know that your work has been, everything you described to in the work, I know you've done, um, but but I won't, we won't get into that on now. So Judy will respond and then we'll have Judy's question. Judy, what? Yeah, I, I will just, I'll give a short response because it would be nice to, to keep the discussion open. Uh, I mean, my husband, who obviously watched me, me a lot, he, he's often said if he ever did a PhD, he'd want to do it the way I did it. Um, just because it was so, it, it was so much part of a collective. So I completely um, resonate there with, with what Veronica said. The, the relationship, and another thing I was told, and I, I struggled, I did my master's here in the UK and I struggled, you know, you're assigned a supervisor, at, well, I was at master's level. Um, and and I, I think she struggled to see, we struggled to see things the way, you know, on the same, in the same way. So everyone who said, if you ever think about a PhD, just choose your, your supervisor very, very carefully so I did a fair amount of research you know myself um not a huge amount because it's, once I read Karen's work I thought uh, I have to meet I have to meet her so that and and then meeting Karen you know that that broke open into all the all the other relationships so so that that is an absolutely crucial relationship of trust um and and it has to be worked at you know because you, you, you there are times when you're not going to see eye to eye so I suppose that would be my little response thank you and um yeah I'm, I'm also just going to ask then in relation to this question and maybe members of this group would like to, to to respond as well is what are the relationships beside the human that are important do you think to supervisors because I know you I, because I know both of you, I know there was so much of that. Do you want to articulate some of that to, um, and all, and also to you in that relationship? There was there was ticks, there were dogs, there was swimming, there was walking, there was the seating and the materials and the Google Docs, which you got, oh my goodness, you know. So, Judy, do you want to talk? And, a little well, bit just money, that? you know, money. <laughs> <laughs> you know, with this this has to be done. This, I mean, I was hugely privileged to, to get funding, but even with funding, you go again, it has to be done by a certain time. So, so that's I'd, that was my first response. Their their deadlines and timelines and their their resource constraints. And if if I'm feeling that, then how much more are, are others feeling it? Mm. Veronica, I don't know if you want to add to that or I think um, Karen Karen Brown's term of time space mattering is relevant in so many ways in terms of re relations, relationships that um, develop and emerge. Um, so much of a traditional PhD is about the individual and individualized and linear and time constrained. And yet the, there's so much more to it. Um, my PhD happened because I got funding. Uh, hmm. At the start, I decided if I got the funding from the NRF, I would do it, otherwise I wouldn't. Hmm. And the funding unexpectedly came through and I had to take time to adjust myself to, oh, this is gonna be real. This hmm. isn't where I thought I'd be in my 60s. Um, it was never my intention, but suddenly I was in a whole different space, a whole different world um, that was unexpected, but I was driven by the intensity and the urgency of engaging with a silent, mm -hmm. hidden um, aspect of gender-based violence, really, and what happens in medicine, which is usually a very closed community. So by working in childhood education, in early childhood education, it helped open up and bring into a public gaze and bring into the open 
what actually happens to students immersed in curricular activities. Mm -hmm. And that's really what drove me. Um, the, the actions, the, the reality that is generally hidden. So it became a much bigger than the individual, than the classroom. And now um, my PhD, I don't feel is finished. It's ongoing. I'm now connecting to international people working on the same um, pr problem and um, working with it together to kind of um, bring change and work with our differences to effect change. Mm. Thanks, Veronica. Sorry, I see Karen has a hand up. I think Zoom needs to change the functionality and make the hands move because it's actually mm. the display. Putting <laughs> in with those plates. <laughs> yeah. Shame. Thanks, Anika, for announcing um, mentioning that. Thanks, Karen. You have a comment or a question? And uh, yeah, just a response. Okay. Um, and yeah, from a sort of supervisor's point of view. Um, what really struck me, Judy, when you say when I, you know, meeting Karen and then I saw meeting Judy. So what what are these meetings? Um, yeah. You know, how generative was that? And, and when you talked about some of these sort of crunch times or moments you wanted to give up. And uh, and of course, both of us probably are thinking of um, a similar period. And mm -hmm. I thought it might be worth just saying a little bit about that um, and it was also um, things that Veronica was mentioning about the importance of the relations mm -hmm. and and I think your the relation um, that you have with a higher being or becoming or you know with the uh, with religion and you know and it took me a while to to see that the only way forward and the only way is not um, negative at all is that the listening as a supervisor uh, involves really connecting up what um, researchers are passionate about. And so the, the, I think the, the, what might be worth mentioning and, you know, talking about, um, uh, Veronica, what you were saying, you know, it's not finished and we're going back to it. Well, actually the text that I think was a breakthrough in for you to make connections that were so important for you and, and turned out to be so generative for your thesis, uh, Judy, was the text, What Fleshes Up? Hmm. And we still again and again and again returning to this text, right? So this afternoon we've got a reading group and we mm. are back into this text. And I think it's a very important point uh, that also Veronica is making and that you are making about this, this kind of um, the constant engagement, the encountering of, uh, of text and coming to it and returning to it. And that your PhD itself was a returning to this moment um in your own work in England then although you were yeah. living here and and I think that has for me so really struck me in post qualitative research is that you find that it becomes really at these kind of a sentence someone has said or uh, a looking at a clock or a hesitation or a gesture or you know that that becomes then the central kind of data that you were talking about mm -hmm. Veronica um, but for me that the learning from with students and being open to what students are or yeah are interested in and connecting that up with what I'm interested in that's also a constant challenge for me and I've learned so much about that and also about religion you know mm -hmm. as a uh, an agnostic or as an atheist you know coming into a lot of research and the same with yours Roseanne so that there are and other students too and there is something about post-humanism that and the relation mm -hmm. with the um, uh, yeah the other than human I suppose it really appeals to also people who are religious so for me it has been 
um, yeah, it's 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 something that what you were talking about at the beginning, uh, Judy, where you were saying about teaching and about learning about what's education actually yeah. and um, supervision. Interestingly enough, at UCT where I was still um, working when we 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 were I was supervising you uh, falls on the teaching. Uh, and a lot of university doesn't, which is very interesting because it's about teaching and learning and it is, you know, but of course teaching in a very different sense. I probably have said enough here, but I thought, yeah, the, just as my, um, especially when you were saying meeting Karen and I thought, oh, meeting Judy, wow, that was, uh, mm. um, that was so much part of, what sort of was produced um produced now we said yesterday we shouldn't we don't say <laughs> what was articulated <laughs> we're meeting each other's universes halfway <laughs> well, <laughs> let me not let me not <laughs> thank you karen thanks for that response um and for your careful listening that you've been doing this morning um judy your which actually leads us into judy's question very beautifully because you've articulated some of the things but i think Sorry, I'm just checking the chat. So Judy, um, basically your question is, what do we care about? I mean, I can put the we in, so go there. Yeah. You're gonna go there and then we ask Veronica to speak to your response. And again, um, if anybody in the room wants to respond, thanks. Judy? I mean, I, I when I did it, I suppose, I start when I came up with the question initially it was what do I care about? what do you care about and I individualized it and then I thought well there is so much that that we care about and it's it's probably good helpful to to think about that and I think it, it overlaps incredibly with Veronica's question exactly that that it's not just individual trajectories that we care about but it is relations relation ships and and i think that probably in a way some sums up what what we perhaps do care about um again with regard to education this this picture of i've just got a, a sense of an, an old man um who some would call uneducated you know being able to sit in a in a community maybe un totally unable to read and write in the sense that we understand, but to listen well, to gather people well, to bring unity, to understand different perspectives. Um, surely that, to bring wisdom, the wisdom of years, surely that is the type of person that you want to learn from, <laughs> rather than someone who, who is educated in our current understanding. So that's what 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 I care about is and and I, and I think what yeah that's what maybe that's just what I care about <laughs> that we that education looks looks different to what it is and is much much um, broader and less confined has less confined trajectories. So do you maybe to just expand your question a little maybe. Could you share an example from your PhD or some part of your research that shows what it is you're talking about? That well, it does come up. I don't know if I, I mean things do come up in the addressing questions. Okay. For the questions you've said, so, okay. so that they will come up then if Perfect. we get, okay. if we have time to get onto that. Yes, we will get there. I'm going to jump to Veronica. Veronica, what what do we care about? What do you? <laughs> it's it's such a vital question. Mm. Um, for supervisors, and I would say my one supervisor cared about the product, that the product would be would be of a, re of a reasonable standard and would go through, and that was his main focus. And my other supervisor cared about me, my students, my a much broader kind of caring, a much more holistic, wanted to, um, made opportunities for me to connect to experts, speak to experts, go to conferences, learn from her, work with her, etc. So it was a much broader um, way of caring. And then it's also a question that I keep on um, approaching with, the, with my students, 
because they care about passing assessments. Assessments mm -hmm. are everything. And they care about wanting to graduate as doctors and wanting to go through the linear system. So what my data and my research showed that the force of the curriculum was far stronger than caring about women in labor being mm. mistreated and facing abuse. Yeah. And that comes through more and more that the curriculum and graduation is a much, much more powerful force than any, any impact of, social, of socially just pedagogy and, and engaging with social unjust, unjust practices. And that is um, really the, the aspect that I focused on a lot about what the power of the curriculum it, um, and how that, uh, how that overrides caring for others. Mm. While we, yet the, we want doctors who are caring, attentive and compassionate. Is that Samaya with a question? No. Yeah, it's, thanks. It's um, it's somebody, Christina. Thanks, <clears throat> Veronica. Welcome, Christina. Thank you for your comment or question or response. <laughs> I think, Veronica, you're also talking now about this, um, or you're touching on not just what we care about, but how we care for that, what we care about, and how can we be calm, response able for what we care about. And if the students care about passing assessments and how do we care for them? Like, how do we also care for our research subjects in an ethical way? Yeah. Thank you, Christina. Those are wonderfully big concepts and questions. Uh, Veronica, do you want to respond or just keep thinking with Christina in, in the question she's posed? I think care is such a broad topic. Um, John, have introduced me to Joan Tronto's ethics of care with all the different elements and um, actually that's the direction in which my work is going now working with ethics of care and mm -hmm. um, working with others there thank you Judy before we go on to the next one do you want to respond to what Christina was asking or suggesting I just love the conversation it's just making me so happy <laughs> Yeah, I mean, if I could just say, I mean, I feel, um, yeah, it's, it's almost, for me, it was compelling, this idea about how do we care. For me, it was deeply compelling and, and challenging because of, of the responsibility. I, I worked with, well, young children worked with me, you know, I worked with, we, I worked with their art, et cetera, et cetera. So this how we care becomes very, um, it's not problematic because if you're not thinking about it because of the ethics that's implied it just is something that you can't um you need to stay confronted with or by in order to um do the work that is required so thank you i was also thinking about that how it's not that we care i mean i don't know if we do care actually i'm slightly troubled by the idea that we care <laughs> there's something paternalistic about that but also then um how we care feels it sort of imposed, it's certainly in post quantitative research and in, and it's not just research, it's, it's in a post qualitative way of trying to be in this world, how do we care, becomes a very, um, I don't want to say important, but yeah, it's, a, it's, it's, it's. Vital yeah, and to I, I think um, certainly Karen Barad is, is brilliant on, on care and, and ethics and, and Tim Ingold as well. And so the, so the, the theorists are, uh, the theory, the theorist practitioners, as they are in themselves, are, are there mm. saying it as well for us, with us. Thanks. I see. Thanks, Judy. And Viv's written um, in the chat. Uh, Viv, oh, I suppose you may, you may not be able to contribute because you're in a, I know you're in another meeting, but for, Viv's saying, for me, caring about is about attunement and attentiveness and listening. And this is... Um, and there's much more to care than caring about. Yeah. Thank you, Viv. Um, thanks for that contribution. So we're going to pause for 10 seconds or 15 seconds just to think, let some of this percolate, and then we'll move on to our next question. And we're doing well with time. We've got about, we'll do 10 more minutes of this discussion and then open it up to the floor. We'll see how that goes. We, so, um, and maybe 
Judy and Veronica, just to orientate yourselves again. The question we're going to move to now is, how did the questions that were driving your research or driving you shift through the process of your research? So how did the questions that were driving you or your research shift through the process of your research? Sorry, and I, I've just realized, let's think about that. I've missed a comment from Nabonke. I'm just gonna thank you. Sorry, my screen moved up. Nabonke Fontonda says, it may help to investigate the nature of our love. <laughs> I explore this in movement and find a wealth of research possibilities there. Thank you, Nabonke. I, I also talk about in my, sorry, I mean, we all will share, but how, um, Karen Barad asks, how can I be responsible to that which I love? So Nabonke, if you'd like to share more about what you said, Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I just think that our bodies um, is the key to understanding what we're caring for so that we don't get involved in too much uh, of, of our thinking and which is incredibly, you know, perturbed by so much what is going on and our responsibilities and how we ought to respond to things we care. But until, well, this is just from personal experience, until one actually uh, feels in your own musculature, you know, or in the affect of your body, when you care and when you don't care, um, it's a very, very close connection with, uh, and I would almost saw, I would say the, the springboard for answering the question of what do I care about? And, and often when I'm working in the coaching and people don't understand that question, uh, I take them through a very simple exercise of just, you know, lifting something and putting it down. And, you know, it can, it also immediately uh, collapses all bound, uh, binary so that it's no longer an object, but it's actually my relationship with that object. So it's just, a, it's a body thing for me, more than a, an idea. Thank you. Thank you, Dabanke. Thanks for sharing that. Mm. Yeah, we, um, I know Judy, it certainly works with affects, works with affect, works with affect, um, mm. yeah, and the body it is. Mm. Thank you for, for bringing that into the conversation too. Okay, um, I don't know if I've missed any more comments, I'll check. The can, I, can I just ask a question about that? I'm absolutely fascinated about what you were saying about it's more the body, but it, it, is it just the body? Of course um, it's, uh, what else is going on? So yeah. it, Maybe you can say a little bit more because I, I just love that idea because isn't it also um, what, what um, Fifth was putting in chat about attunement and so it's noticing and, and Anat Singh talks about that of course beautifully in her 2015 book about the mushrooms. Um, about the, the art, there's a real art of paying attention and noticing. So that, that um, because I, I'm just thinking, you know, I'm just, oh, I would like some more water. As you were, um, as you were talking, um, and then I thought about just going to the water bottle, that is that relation. And I, I can see that in that movement, but it's it's also more than that because I could do it completely unthinkingly. Um, I don't know, just a just a thought that just. I think the co the uh, conversation is an ending uh, because we are basically confronting the body mind split. Um, and uh, in working in this way, uh, I'm sort of following Agamben's uh, notion in his mm. book, um, what is his book called? The Use of Bodies, um, where he, and which I extract exercises from. Uh, so you could work with an object, um, you know, it's just an object. So we really understand 
what we mean uh, when you have to investigate what is an object. So you uh, work with your body in all kinds of different ways so you truly understand what has been meant by object and how I'm, am I still relating to a thing as object, uh, you know, with the trajectory to collapse that in subject as well. But then the next step would be, um, you know, t picking up that uh, item and say, I like you. I, I like you. Uh, and then one works with that and see how your body's completely shifted in its own ontology uh, once you move into that, that frame. And then the next thing is, I love you. Uh, and that is, again, a whole other dance. And I'm speaking as a dancer, by the way. Um, and then uh, finally, you pick up that object, stroke subject by now, uh, and you say, I love myself. Um, and one can take that further as well. So it's really, it's, it's something that I also say, you know, one needs to get on the floor with it as a dancer. So one is on the floor here, as if your whole body can be uh, involved in it. One's also not necessarily upright. You can lie down. You can be upside down, you can roll while you're doing this. So it just shifts um, one's own uh, sense of um, how one is in the world. And then objects are no longer objects. So, uh, and there's also a whole lot of uh, post human uh, body related. Um, I mean, I was looking at the glossary and thinking. There are so many body related terms that could be added to that glossary uh, simply by moving uh, all these concepts. Um, yeah. Thanks. Thank you, Nabonke. I mean, look, it feels like a, <laughs> we are constrained by time and it feels like a much longer discussion. But um, yeah, so I'm sorry if you feel I'm interrupting, but thank you for, for that response. Thanks. Okay, so now I think Judy and Veronica have had a bit more time. We take along everything we've been listening to this morning. Veronica, are you ready to respond to your comment about questions? Um, sorry, Shuaib, do you want to just... Sorry, Veronica, are you happy for Shuaib to go first? Um, yeah, Shuaib, do you want to just make your comment and then we'll... Yeah, uh, so... So can you, am I the only, I can't really hear you. Can, can you hear me? Mm. Can you hear me better now, yeah? Okay, um, since I, I'm recuperating from COVID-19, I'm choosing not to turn my video on. Okay. So, sorry for that. Get, get better uh, so I'm going uh, back to this question of, you know, what is the relationship? Shaib, actually, now you've gone, you've disappeared completely. So maybe just, um, could you try your connection one more time and then we... Perhaps you yeah, could write a text yeah. question because we can't hear. Yeah, thanks. No, yeah. I'm connecting those two questions. You know, I mean, you, you were talking about caring and uh, you're also talking about relationship. Yeah. Um, I think um, both can be tied together. Um, for instance, if you're asking this question about um, what do we care about, um, I guess in the act of uh, caring, uh, something or somebody is uh, taken care of and uh, somebody or something is not taken care of uh, in the mm -hmm. process of you know, caring. Yeah. Um, so uh, I, I'm supervising you know, a couple of uh, students. Uh, so they, one of the students, PhD students, wanted to work on uh, artworks that were created during the CAA protest in India. I'm from India. Mm -hmm. okay. um, Citizenship Amendment Act. Um, so it's quite an interesting topic, and she wanted to work on uh, how artworks are created and how they're circulated in digital media spaces. Um, and she was also interested in. Uh, 
I'm studying how uh, you know you can probably identify um, affect uh, in both comments as well as in the artwork uh, and uh, turn these artworks into text using uh, uh, you know some of the software tools and then enter these uh, uh, affective potentials into the text and then return this back into I mean return this to uh, an image and see what all happens. Uh, but in, unfortunately, um, I had to take a decision that you know we are not going to work on CAA, um, given the fact that there's a lot of surveillance, and then and the fact that PhD thesis would be in the public domain at some point in time, and it would become easier for people to label me X, Y, Z, whatever. So for that purpose, um, I mean, so I mean, this is carrying. I don't know if I'm doing it on my own volition in agreement with what my ethical sense would want me to do, or I have to work against, you know, this. Uh, so the student was, in fact, you know, pretty much disappointed and went to the extent of even um, discontinuing PhD. And so there are a lot of these elements, you know, that are at uh, work and at uh, play. Uh, so I'm not actually detailing you know, a lot of these factors that are at play here. Um, so there are also clear um, instructions, you know, from the state um, detailing as to what kind of topics, you know, could be pursued both at the master's level dissertations as well as at the doctoral level dissertation. So given all of this, when I started having interactions with leading academicians in the country, so they also started, in fact, you know, they're all uh, typical theorists and uh, academicians, you know, who'd engage with topics of this kind, but um, they all suggested that it's uh, better to stay silent. Um, and this, in a sense, like, you know, what is it that, uh, as a supervisor, I'm taking care of? I mean, both in terms of topic as well as, you know, the student, but what is not taken care of, in a sense, is also, um, I think, affecting the relationship right, uh, in some ways or the other. So this is something that I actually thought I should, you know, uh, ex I mean, just bring it to your, I mean, kind notice. Thank you. Thank you, Shuaib, and please get better soon. Um, Judy, you were, um, do you want to make a comment about what Shuaib was saying or? Just simply how incredibly political our, our work is. <laughs> mm. Incredible. Mm. And scare, and that's I suppose that's the scary part is is yeah, yeah. The Thank consequences you for of what we do. Telling us about expressing your experiences. You know. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure if I'm saying your name correctly. Maybe Leonosia, or um, would you correct me if I'm incorrect? Mm -hmm. You want to ask your question or make a response? I have a response. Hello. Um, it's uh, pronounced Leonosia. Thank Leon. you very much for, for recognizing me. Um, I'm actually very new in this uh, paradigm of post-qualitative um, research. I haven't done anything, but um, I'm, uh, just, I would just like to share an anecdote because I'm a concurrent PhD student in a uh, university in the Philippines. And uh, I'm, my study is about uh, the, the, the rhetoric of music, communication in music. Um, as I have, you know, uh, been listening in the in the um, you know talks. Um, it dawned on me somehow that um, in my search for rhetorical meanings, um, I have always cared about these profundities of of meanings beyond persuasion in my musical performances, my interpretations. Uh, but I wanted to to hear the unheard. To ponder into the into the unknown in, mus in musical discourse, and it was really guiding me all throughout my paper. I I, I have already finished my paper, and I'm I'm delivering my final defense, you know, in, in a week. And up to this time, I have always uh, beyond words. I've always really cared about the flow of meanings in my musical interpretations, which has led me to believe that. Really, mu music as a, as, a, as a communication practice is this elucidation of meanings as natural flows of energy. The, this energy 
um, becomes my expression of who, who I am. And uh, it has really been, like I said, it's really been guiding me all throughout the, the journey. And, and beyond that, these forms, I have also pondered that these forms of meanings as, as natural flows of energy are always abundant in the environment. For example, um, uh, as a performer, I, I am a pianist by profession and, and, and my study is about this confluence of meanings from the performer um, when interpreting a, a musical sheet and then how is the meaning elucidated and, and resonated to the audience. And then and, and I've realized that these meanings um, that are known to me may not necessarily be absorbed by the listening audience, but because, they, but because they are natural energy forms that are thrown in the environment, uh, some members of the society who may not necessarily be the, in the audience can even capture those meanings. So even if, even, if someone, if, even if someone did not understand what I was talking about in my music, somebody else in, in the higher you know, uh, atmosphere uh, would have uh, captured this energy form of meanings. And this, this uh, idea has really been persisting all throughout the, my analysis. And uh, yeah, uh, just to, to perhaps answer the question of what I cared for in a, in a very personal um, way of addressing the question is really, it's really this uh, embarking upon the profundity of, of the hidden you know, meaning, which is really uh, an energy in itself. And it's so abundant. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's profound and it's, uh, it creates and it multiplies. It, it creates a constellation, it creates associations. And, and all these um, connections, like well, when, when me, the, the, the performer, will have my own personal resonances to a particular form of music. And then these associations can even you know, multiply exponentially. And these are the meanings that, uh, that will further uh, be, be created as energy forms. And some of these energy meanings uh, are known to me and some of them are unconsciously driven. And the same way the audience will, will, will be able to capture these energy forms, or they may not, or they can create their own indefinite meanings because music is really about this adventure of meaningful resonances and all sorts. So yeah, uh, you know, 332 pages of, of wandering around, you know, this constellation based uh, energy form of meanings has, has been my guiding, <laughs> You know, uh, you know, principle perhaps I would say throughout my journey, and I'm delivering my final dissertation, my final defense next week. And I thought I just wanted to share this um, little anecdote. Thank you very much. Thanks, Leon. Here, and we're wishing you fingers are crossed all the best for your defense next week. <laughs> Thank you. We don't know how you manage, but we know, yeah, all the best. Um, we've got about um, we've got about seven minutes, so I'm just going to ask. Veronica to share and then and Judy to respond to, but maybe let's just get back to those, just some of those questions that were driving your research and how they shifted or changed, or maybe they stayed the same. Well, I doubt that. Veronica? Um, sorry, I'm not quite sure. Are you look, wanting me to talk about how my research moved or shifted or? Um... Well, you know, you, you know, you were talking about this product and how, I mean, we in South Africa, what is required of us is to have um, some sort of format. And so we have these research questions that were possibly in your proposal. Did they stay the same throughout your PhD or were they different at the end of that process? Well, I think I didn't really try and bring sameness through my PhD or common, or common threads. It was it was there were different aspects to it but what really drove me and um, was how learning at university is not finished with um with students graduating that that stays with them and um it, it connects with um karen barad's um diffraction of time and I, I'll just um, read a quote that has always stayed with me and influenced my questions and my thinking, that the past matters and so does the future. 
but the past is never left behind, never finished once and for all. And the future is not what will come to be in an unfolding of the present moment. Rather, the past and the future are enfolded participants in matters iterative becoming. So I feel that it's there's been movement in terms of my thinking, my students, and it's about not thinking in a linear way, but thinking in the cyclical way. What are we doing that gestures to the future? And um, that has always been, in a way, a driver since I came into post-humanism, post-qualitative research, in terms of not looking at compartmentalizing and things. Um, the the, um, the our Philippines participants spoke about the flow of energies, and I thought that was very interesting as well. That flow of energies is not a straightforward flow. It's always moving in different directions. And for me, that was really, really important to keep thinking in that way. I hope that um, helps. Thanks, Veronica. Um, I'll let Judy, you can respond to Veronica's question by responding to your own, about your own question. Judy. Yeah, I, I think it, it's probably the best way to do it is just to, to read what I've written and you'll see the overlaps. <laughs> so, um, I think the main shift that happened for me uh, in terms of my, my the questions I was asking um, is that I was in, through the PhD process, I was enabled to find a, a way of, of, to ask questions that were more just. My initial questions were embedded in the language that schooling is embedded in, like how can I help these children who are so behind move forward? I was employed for nine years in an informal settlement school to run a literacy support class. And my job was presented in terms of taking more or less illiterate older children out of their classes and helping them to grasp basic literacy. What was true though, was that many of these children who could not read or write either at all or only very little were highly literate in other terms. For example, they wanted to talk about differences between America, Europe, China, and South Africa. They wanted to talk about economics, wealth creation, and the ethics of ownership and labor. These were the things they were thinking about and that puzzled them. So my question became, how does the idea of undergoing, in other words, what we are undergoing in our lives, work in forming literacy? So the notion of literacy development or literacy research in any pre-specified way um, then has to be overturned. So that was my shift. <laughs> Thank you, Judy. I am aware of time. And so unfortunately that is a constraint. We are in a program. And so even though I'm sure all of you are going, oh, there's more, there's more. Be grateful there's more <laughs> um, but we're going to, to to leave them more to simmer to bubble to percolate to find people in the group you want to email and ask questions to and um, we'll be able to connect again but for now we do need to wrap up and just to and i just do need to say thank you in this last minute so thank you to karen of course for um, enabling this to this process to happen and to vive as the co-pis on the um, post qualitative research collective Judy and Veronica, thank you for returning to your PhD, which is a fraught process. Academia is, is violent in many ways. It's difficult and complex. And so thank you for the way you were able to take us through the work you've been doing um, and make us think differently or maybe think in the same way today. Thank you to all of the participants for your generous listening and the way you were able to contribute and ask questions in this space. And of course, to Annika Slubbert, our research assistant who um, is, is much more than what our title suggests, but really is, is kind and is able to go gently, Rose, and you left out <laughs> a comment. So, Annika, for setting up the, the beautiful posters and then just, and for helping us today set up the Zoom. Can I just say that we will be having another session like this one on Friday, talking to two more PhD students. I think Nina Odegaard was in the room a minute ago. She's here. And Angela Molloy Murphy will be talking about their PhD experiences. If you've recently graduated and want to be part of We'll be doing this throughout the year. Please send me an email or Annika. And if you're a supervisor and you have a student who you think would be um, is in the 
is ready to share about the experience, please let us know. We'd love to know because we, we need to be talking about post qualitative research and thinking it and being it and doing it. So just from me, thanks everyone. Thank you for being here today. Um, and yeah, I really appreciate it this time together. Can, I, can I just say something really <laughs> about just thanking you, Roseanne, for, uh, for difficultating this process with those, and you can see how the questions work. So just to pick up on the title also of this webinar series, which is Returning, and we pick this up after our introductions at 12. What, 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 what is returning actually? Is it just returning or is it returning? And what is it that we can learn about that as a methodology? And Roseanne will be coming back into the Zoom room. Um, and not only we, we're going to introduce the project, but then Roseanne is actually going to come this way. And then we're going to do a, a, a practical, practical, as if there is such a thing as just theory and practice. We're going to disrupt that as well. But we pick up also not only returning as a concept, but also questions and um, and concepts. So these are at the heart of post qualitative research and uh, we won't say much more about that. Uh, just uh, we hope we'll see you there. I know that some people are almost in the pajamas, so we will be uh, recording it so that you can see it later. And, and it's a shame that we can't stay up for 24 hours, but um, uh, yeah, uh, it is just the way it is. But also later on, we will have the What Flashes Up a reading group. And so, yeah, stay tuned in, as they say on the radio. Um, so I'll see you in. We have a, a quarter of an hour break and I'll see you then. And thanks again, uh, Dr. Reynolds. <laughs> thanks, Karen. On, on one quick logistical note, Annika, is it the same? I don't want to confuse anyone, but the same Zoom link for 1030. Yes, same Zoom link. Perfect. Right. Great. Thanks, everyone. Be safe. Be well. Take care. Bye. Bye.